This is Nick Redding, and you're listening to PreserveCast, a podcast with a worldwide listenership that explores the broad world of preservation from every angle, from drones to mudlarking and everything in between. Now, let's get preserving. On this year's PreserveCast Spooktacular, we're talking with Lisa Morton, an award-winning author and historian of Halloween, to talk about the history of one of America's favorite holidays as we approach the spookiest day of the year. This is Nick Redding, and you're listening to PreserveCast today. We're really excited to be joined by author and historian Lisa Morton, who, among other books, has just uh, recently published a book called Trick or Treat, A History of Halloween, um, which is an award-winning book, uh, and we're really excited to be chatting with her to here today. Um, before we get started in talking about the history of Halloween, though, where did you grow up? And what got you so interested in history and writing? Did you have sort of a, a spark moment that you can look back on? I grew up in the Southern California area. Um, I am uh, born and raised Los Angelino. And um, there was a moment which was that instant golden spark when I said, oh, this is what I want to do for a living. And it was when I saw a little movie called The Exorcist. Um, I was very, my children, mom had taken me to see it. And it just, the effect it had on an audience was incredible. Um, there's been nothing like it. It's really hard to describe now to people who weren't there. But I saw what that was doing to an audience and said, that's what I want to do. I want to have that kind of impact on people. So it was a terrifying movie that got you uh, down this road, basically, is what you could say. <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> and how I'm just out of curiosity, how old were you when you saw it? I was 15. Yeah. OK, so a very impressionable age. And were you terrified, but uh, like wanted to know more or what was that? You just wanted to have that same impact on others. It was my attention was kind of gone, went back and forth between what was going on in the movie and what was happening to the audience. I remember looking at people around me as much as looking at what was happening on the screen with that movie, because people were screaming and running and crying and fainting. I mean, it was really incredible to watch. Um, and I like I said, I just remember looking at people and just thinking, wow, what's going on here? That would be really cool to be able to do that. <laughs> So so you have the spark moment. You see The Exorcist. You want to have this impact. Your career has gone in different ways, but you've been an, an author and a historian. Where, what was sort of your, your first foray into this? Because obviously this book has just been recently published in the past couple of years. Um, but where did you kind of get your start as an author? How did that all come together? I actually started as a screenwriter. Um, that was what I studied in college, and that was what I thought I wanted to do until I actually had some success in that area. Um, and then I found out that I was not incredibly proud of having some really bad movies out there that had my name plastered all over them. Um, and at that point, I had a number of author friends who were kind of urging me to get more into fiction writing, and um, I did, and I found that that was far more satisfying to me. I loved writing fiction, and then that led eventually to nonfiction. So by about the uh, mid-90s was when I really settled down into the kind of stuff I'm writing now. And so – Obviously, among other things, you've, you've published um, this book that we're going to be talking about here today, Trick or Treat, A History of Halloween, which is perfect for our audience, which is interested in history and preservation and, and all those, the intersections thereof. You know, it sort of seems like almost your career kind of led you to this moment to tell the story of the history of Halloween. Do, do, do you feel that way? Was this like all kind of building to this moment to tell this story? Because like so much of what you've talked about is spooky and writing these different things and fiction and nonfiction. Is, were you, did you always want to write sort of a, a history, this comprehensive story of Halloween? I, I actually kind of fell into that by accident. Um, I, before I wrote this book, I wrote another book on Halloween called the Halloween Encyclopedia that came out in the early 2000s. And that book had been a situation where I had worked with this publisher before on a different book, which was a film book. And they said to me after that book, Hey, we should do another book together. Is there anything you'd like to write? And I looked at things that they had just brought out and they had just released something called the Christmas Encyclopedia. And, and I thought, Oh, that's interesting. 
interesting. No one has done a Halloween encyclopedia. And I mean, I always had loved Halloween, certainly. And um, I had a little collection of old books and so forth on the holiday. And um, of course, writing an encyclopedia was very, very labor and research intensive, especially back in, this was just before they digitized books and put them online. So it involved year a year's worth of visits to libraries and digging stuff out. And by the time that was done, I had so much information that it was really easy to to roll it over into two other books, actually. Um, Trick or Treat, A History of Halloween is my third book on the um, uh, nonfiction book on Halloween. And um, obviously, by the time you've written three books on a subject, you've become somewhat obsessed with it. So <laughs> I have, uh, my interest in Halloween continues and I collect new information every year. So when people come to, when they give you like a Christmas present, is it always a Halloween gift now? It's sort of like, oh, it's it's our Halloween friend. We'll give her Halloween something. Do you just constantly get Halloween gifts? I do. and you, But you know what's fun is I get them throughout the year because people are like cleaning out their garages or something and, and will show up suddenly out of nowhere and hand me these amazing things. It's fun. Um, so so let's talk about Halloween and your book, Trick or Treat, History of Halloween, which we have uh, a link in the show notes to pick up your copy of it. Perfect time of the year to do it. Um, and it's it really is a, a fantastic read. So um, Halloween, it seems like something that it's it's like one of these things where it's just it's so pervasive. It's like, I don't know, like peanut butter and jelly. It's like, oh, well, that doesn't have a history. That's just always existed. But of course it does. So it seems like it's something that's always existed in the United States. But but what are its, I mean, in a nutshell, and I, obviously there's a whole book that goes into this, but what are its roots in America? When when does it, wh where do we see Halloween sort of beginning? And then we can kind of get into that, like when did it take hold and really kind of become the story that we know today? But but what are its its roots as far as you're concerned in the U.S.? In the U.S., it, it and that's a really good way of phrasing your question, Nick, because people do think it goes back hundreds of years. People think trick or treat goes back back hundreds of years. And those are both really recent. Halloween didn't really arrive in the U.S. until the 1840s. Um, and at that point, there was a famine over in Ireland and Scotland that sent a lot of people fleeing their homelands and coming over to the U.S. And they loved Halloween. They brought that tradition with them. And so it is maybe 10, 15 years later that we start to see the holiday really taking root here. And the, the way it first catches on in the U.S. is via magazines, um, because the new printing technologies had allowed the mass distribution of magazines. And there were a lot of magazines, and they were very, very popular, especially with middle class women who had some um, both leisure time and a little bit of expendable cash. And the magazines love to print sort of quaint, charming stories of um, various traditions and folklore and so forth. And they started printing these really sweet Halloween themed stories. Usually they were about a family that had an Irish or a Scottish or even an English um, house servant living with them. And they'd picked up the traditions from them. And um, people read these stories stories and thought the descriptions of the parties in them, because they usually center around a party, were so lovely that they wanted to hold their own Halloween parties. And so it really is by about the 1870s that we are starting to really see it spread, and it's due to these parties now. And how different would that Halloween have been from the Halloween that we'll be, you know, celebrating this year? Like, is it, would we even recognize it? Not a lot of it. We would certainly recognize a party being held on October 31st. Um, the parties were mainly geared towards children, and they involved things like um, playing little fortune-telling games. And fortune-telling games were something that the Scottish in particular had been obsessed with at Halloween. Um, we can look at this amazing 1785 poem by Robert Burns called Halloween, which is a description of a Scottish Halloween party. And it's very detailed. And a lot of those things found their way into the American parties for the kids. So the kids were doing 
things like um, lining up a series of nuts before the family hearth, and you would name the nuts for different people, and depending on which nut cracked first might be who you were going to end up marrying. Um, or they would play little games where they would blindfold the kids, and they'd have different bowls set out with different things in them, and the kid would the blindfolded child would go up and touch one of the bowls, and that would uh, that would prophesy what their future was going to be. If you touched the bowl that had the goose leg in it, you were going to be an old maid. If you touched the bowl that had the dime in it, you were going to be rich, that kind of thing. And the other things they would do at these parties would be have, of course, food, um, probably some seasonal things like apple cider, um, popcorn, and then they would also make candy. Um, they made taffy, which involved a lot of pulling. And so they would give the kids these long ends of this taffy to pull. Um, so that would have been a Halloween circus, say, <clears throat> excuse me, 1870. And there would have been no, maybe the costuming might have been confined to the kids were given funny little witches hats, that kind of thing. But there would have been no full costuming. There would have been no, um, uh, some, nothing incredibly scary. Maybe if the kids stayed late enough, they might be told a ghost story. And that would have been it. There would not have been a, a lot of adult participation either. Hmm. Now, as a, as a historian of this and somebody, obviously, who loves Halloween, have you ever hosted your own, like, circa 1870s Halloween party where you, you know, see if you're going to be an old maid or you're going to be rich or that kind of thing? <laughs> I haven't, but that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe that's that's what you can do this year. So, so the version that we know today, trick-or-treat and chocolate and, you know, full costuming, things like that. Um, and you go into this in the book, but for people listening, when when does that come about? Because obviously what you're describing post-Civil War era, it's very, very different. It's it's almost not something that's even recognizable as, as Halloween today. The Halloween that we know, when does that kind of begin to take root? That's much later. And, and one of the interesting things about Halloween, one of the reasons it's so fun to study is it's constantly shifting its identity there actually is going to be another shift in its identity between that 1870s and what we know now, and that is the era of prank playing. Um, by the time you get into the early 20th century, Halloween has kind of been taken over by juvenile boys who have gained this sort of Irish love of prank playing. That was something that the Irish loved to do. And at first, the pranks are pretty innocent. The kids, for example, will go out to the local farmer's house and maybe tip over his outhouse. Or um, there was a thing they would do where they would disassemble the gate at the front fence and reassemble the gate somewhere bizarre like the roof of the barn. And in fact, this was so common that in many areas, they started to call Halloween gate night. And the problem with all of this prank playing was when it moved into the cities, as America became much more, much more urbanized in the 1920s and early 30s, um, and the kids moved into the cities, it became vandalism, and it was costing cities millions of dollars. The kids were setting fires and breaking light fixtures and smashing windows and tripping people on sidewalks, and um, it got to the point where... 1933, a lot of newspapers called that year Black Halloween. Um, not only was this prank playing now vandalism, but it was the height of the Great Depression, and, and the cities didn't even have money to pay for a lot of this repair. And so some of the cities were considering banning Halloween altogether, but fortunately, a few of them thought, you know, maybe there's a better way to do this. Maybe we can buy these kids off. And so they got together these civil committees, civic committees who uh, put together little pamphlets and the little pamphlets would go out to homeowners in the area. And the little pamphlets would talk about, OK, you can't afford to put on your own party for these kids. But if a whole neighborhood gets together, you can all pool your resources and you can give these kids a great night that will keep them from prank playing. And these things ended up being called house to house parties. And they were set up so that the first house might offer the kids a really simple little cost 
costume, just like a sheet with two holes. So the kids now get to be a ghost. And the next house would have their basement set up as a very primitive form of a haunted attraction. Kids would go down the stairs. It would be dark. Somebody would jump out at them. There'd be glowing things on the walls, that sort of thing. The next house would offer the kids some games. And then the last house would give them some treats. And this proved to be very successful. And in 1936 is the first time that we get a national magazine article that mentions Trick or Treat. And that um, article, by the way, has the title of Victim of the Window Soaping Brigade. <laughs> and it's a woman, I forget where she is, but she's just a typical housewife who is talking about how she gave the kids a party on Halloween night and they left her house alone. Um, and she uses the phrase Trick or Treat. And so trick or treat is really less than a century old, and it doesn't even become really well established until after World War II, that war gets in the way, sugar is very scarce, people can't afford the treats and so forth. So as soon as the war is done, trick or treat really settles in. And at that point, it is really across the entire country. It's it's so fascinating that it's just these things that we think have always existed, and obviously there's a there's a history to everything, um, which is so exciting to kind of hear that and and hear it come through and what you're describing. You know, in terms of misconceptions, are there standard misconceptions that you come across that people think about Halloween that you're like, no, that is not the case. Like, is there anything that just kind of drives you nuts that like you know is not true but people think it? Oh, yes. I, I often call it the the holiday of the most misconceptions. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, uh, people, I mean, you can just start with the name. How many people know what that name really means? It sounds sort of almost pagan in a weird way, and yet it, it breaks down to All Hollows Evening. Um, hollow was an old word for saints, and so November 1st is All Saints Day, the evening before... Um, but my favorite one is the idea that that Halloween celebrates a Celtic Lord of Death. I have heard that repeated over and over. And I actually have pinpointed the exact moment in history when that went terribly wrong. Um, it was in the 18th century. There was a British surveyor named Charles Valency who was sent over to survey and map Ireland. And he was there for something like 12 years. And he became so obsessed with old Celtic lore and language that he collected six volumes worth of material that were published and that found their way into libraries all over the world. The only problem with all of this was Valency was widely denounced at his time. He his peers said things like he's been more he's been responsible for more gibberish than any other man alive. I mean, they just thought he was a fool. And he arbitrarily decided that almost everything historians already knew about the Celts was wrong, just out of nowhere. And one of the things that that was already well known at the time was that the word Samhain, which is the old Celtic holiday celebrated on October 31st that had, that is the sort of great granddaddy of Halloween. He decided that it did not mean summer's end, which was the commonly accepted translation, but that it referred to an Indian deity. The name was vaguely similar. Somehow he used an incredibly convoluted chain of reasoning to go from that to, and so uh, Salon was actually the worshiping of a god of death. The problem with this is, like I mentioned earlier, his books found their way into libraries all over the world. It created what I think of as the alternate history of Halloween, <laughs> except that his is not even remotely accurate. And yet, unfortunately, that reputation has found its way into a lot of the common, commonly accepted notions of what Halloween is. Um, and it's just not true at all. Um also, I hear, as I mentioned earlier as well, that people tend to think trick-or-treat is thousands of years old. I've heard it described as, oh, it goes back to the ancient Druids dressing in animal skins. No, we, we, the truth is we know very little about the Celts. They didn't write down their history. We know about Samhain from Christian missionaries who recorded some of it. Um, but there is absolutely no indication that the Celts or their Druid priest dressed in animal skins at Samhain and cavorted around fires and 
blah, blah, blah. So um, trick or treat's quite recent. So the myth around Samhain and and <clears throat> this, you know, pagan worship and all this kind of stuff, is that what created the concern among some Christian communities about like Halloween is a bad thing because it's devil worship and all that kind of stuff? Is that the same part of the misconception? Was that always, was there always, was there always a Christian kind of pushback against Halloween or is that a more recent phenomena? That's, that's quite recent. And yes, I'm, I'm fairly certain that dates to that misconception about the Lord of death. There was a book that was published in the, I think the forties or the fifties called Halloween through 20 centuries that was written by a couple, um, uh, Adele and Ralph Linton, and it repeats the Lord of death, um, thing. And they wrote a number of sort of species history books. They actually, on the last page of their book, referred to Halloween as a degenerate holiday. And unfortunately, a lot of the modern organizations refer back to that book in particular. They, they don't use all of the other excellent um, histories of Halloween that have been produced. And it's, it's unfortunate that that was really the only history of the holiday that was published in the middle of the 20th century. So it's the one that um, a lot of these groups have relied on. Well, maybe this is a good place to take a quick break, come back, talk about Halloween today, and then um, places associated with Halloween and where you're headed next in your writing career. And we'll do that right here on PreserveCast. Hey, it's Nick here. And I want to remind you briefly that your support is what makes this podcast possible. To keep hearing important stories like this one, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and follow along on social media at PreserveCast. You can also continue supporting the podcast with a donation at PreserveCast.org. PreserveCast is sponsored by the 1772 Foundation and powered by Preservation Maryland, a nonprofit organization that believes we all succeed when we all know more about our past. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to PreserveCast today. We're super excited to be continuing our current conversation with Lisa Morton, um, who is an award-winning author uh, who recently published a book called Trick or Treat, A History of Halloween. We've been talking all about Halloween um, and misconceptions and its history and, and how it became um, the sort of juggernaut uh, um, holiday that it is today in the United States. It, you know, Halloween, I suppose, has become... I mean, it's it's an understatement to say become rather commercial. And now it seems to take up a whole month. I don't know if you've been tracking this where they call it like spooky season. And that to me seems like a new thing. I don't know if that's true or not. But has has that always been the case? Is it is it is it growing in its popularity? Are you seeing that compared to where it was even 10 or 15 years ago? It's interesting that this year in particular, there are two things that have popped up that make me think it suddenly has leapt forward somehow. Um, one is that in my area, people are decorating way earlier. Um, two weeks ago, I started to see a lot of yards that were already decked out for Halloween. I mean, it was barely October. October. It wasn't October. And people were already in the, the spirit, no pun intended. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is that this season in particular, for some reason, I am getting asked over and over and over about Christmas ghost stories. Um, so that seems to be a really hot topic this year for whatever reason. And it's interesting to me that they are asking the Halloween expert about this. Um, I, in my secret moments, I, I like to think of it as the holiday gaining dominance over Christmas. But um, it's yeah, it definitely seems to be growing. I suspect part of that is that we didn't get our Halloween last year. Um, so a lot of people really wanted to celebrate big this year. And it, so that that's sort of what accounts for it, I suppose. Um, and does it continue to grow? Does it continue to change? Are there changes that you're seeing um, that surprise you about this? I mean, is that is that or is it just always going to be an evolving holiday? I, I think it will continue to evolve. There are a couple of things that have changed just in the last 20 years that I've noticed. Number one is the explosive growth of haunted attractions. Um, a haunted attraction 
the kind of big scale things that we see now did not exist 40 years ago. Um, in the mid 80s was when the amusement parks got the idea of taking their down fall season and converting their parks into Halloween themed at attractions and finding a gigantic gold mine in that. And then by the 90s, that spread into the standalone haunted houses, the professional level ones. There are probably over 3,000 of those in the U.S. alone. Um, in, in addition to the amusement parks and in addition to the home haunters, um, people who just love to do very intricate yard displays. And that is something that I don't think anyone would have predicted 30 or 40 years ago. The other thing that's really interesting Interesting, and this is very recent, just within the last 15 or 20 years, is the way Halloween is catching on all over the globe. Um, it has been big for a while in places like Japan, but it is now catching on in um, all over Europe. The, the Euro I was just chatting yesterday with European friends about how all of their amusement parks are now doing seasonal makeovers. And in parts of Europe, it's really interesting that they are celebrating Halloween on the evening of October 31st. And then on the day of November 1st, they are still maintaining their old All Saints Day um, rituals, which consist mainly of going to a cemetery and cleaning and decorating the grave of a loved one. Um, it's a very somber kind of um, traditional observance. And it's a really interesting pairing. They're, they're getting their craziness in the night before and the sort of sober thing the next day. And this is the first year that I've heard of Halloween catching on in India, which is really surprising to me. Um, I It had already begun to explode in Australia. Um, seeing it spread to these areas of the southern hemisphere is always a little bit surprising because it loses the harvest and seasonal celebration part of it. That's interesting. And it's interesting, of course, that and it's sort of this American version of Halloween that's spreading. Does candy go with it in all of these countries as well? Oh, yes. And the, the big reason that it has started to spread to a lot of these countries is um, television. The shows like The Simpsons, which is the most popular popular syndicated television show in history, is sold to virtually every market on Earth. People see their yearly Treehouse of Horror Halloween episode. They love it. They see this same thing pop up in other sitcoms that have been sold to them. They think it looks great. And then you get the candy companies and the food retailers like McDonald's coming in with special, special seasonal happy meals and so forth. And it really begins to spread the Halloween throughout the um, culture of these areas. So we talk a lot here on PreserveCast, obviously, as a preservation podcast about place and history and connections to places. Are there places on the landscape, if you could think of them, that you would be like, that's a place that needs to be preserved, or there's a fantastic story associated with Halloween in that place? Are there specific historic buildings or places on the landscape that that have a connection with Halloween's story or is it more sort of ephemeral? Uh, there is one place called Anoka, Minnesota, which proclaimed itself the Halloween capital of the world several decades ago. Um, and they are quite well known now. They maintain that title. They do a lot of fun yearly things to recognize the holiday. And, and they they seem to kind of maintain a traditional approach to the holiday. They do parades and costuming and pumpkin carving. And um, Anoka, I think, is even where when the U.S. Postal Service launched the first Halloween stamps a few years ago. Uh, I think they launched them in Anoka. So Anoka is kind of a fun place that we probably should um, be aware of in terms of Halloween history. I don't know of a particular building or structure or anything like that that we could tie firmly to Halloween. Um, the other uh, event that's been around for decades now that is worth remembering is the Greenwich Village Parade in New York, um, which started as a small puppet parade. 
and was, of course, largely taken over by the LGBTQ community in New York and is now something that draws a million people and is a remarkable event every year. So um, I don't know if there's a way of preserving a parade, but that would certainly be something that we should we should always observe. Interesting. So where are you headed next? What are you working on? Um, what's in the what's in your crosshairs in terms of uh, history writing? Is it more Halloween? Where are you headed? Um, there actually is a f- film book that I cannot talk about quite yet, which will probably be the next big project. Um, right now, I'm just trying to get through October. <laughs> <laughs> My Octobers tend to go a little crazy. My last book, actually, um, my last nonfiction book was something called Calling the Spirits, a History of Seances. And so I'm doing both a lot of Halloween presentations this year and um, panels and lectures and so forth on the history of seances. In fact, I gave one of those last night to the Los Angeles library system. Well, we'll have to have you back to uh, to do a, a seance with us and uh, conjure up some preservation spirits. Um, <laughs> before we go, this tends to be the most difficult question for people who join us on PreserveCast, but do you have a favorite historic place or site? Oh, a favorite historic place. Well, I am a lifelong Californian, so I have to probably pick something close to me. I love Griffith Park, um, and I love both Griffith Park and at the in the center of Griffith Park, the Ranger Station. And a lot of people don't know this. The Ranger Station is actually the original um, Feliz family adobe that dates back to the middle of the 19th century and they moved it to its current location. And it's, it's not even that well marked. You kind of have to walk up to a side of the building across the plants and so forth to see the bronze plaque that commemorates that. But that whole history of Griffith park is fascinating. I love Griffith park anyway, so I'd probably pick that. Well, that is a, that's a fantastic answer for a, for a Californian. And <laughs> Um, it's just been really fascinating. Again, people can pick up the book. There's a link in the show notes um, to get a copy of Lisa's book. And we also have a link to Lisa's website so you can find out about all of her other books, seances and the encyclopedia and everything that we've talked about um, today about Trick or Treat, A History of Halloween with Lisa Morton. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us during your busy, spooky season. Oh, thank you so much, Nick. Thanks for listening to PreserveCast. To dig deeper into this episode's story, head over to PreserveCast.org for show notes and our collection of previous episodes. Don't forget to engage with this podcast by subscribing, commenting, and leaving a review. Follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at PreserveCast for even more. PreserveCast is currently recorded in Walkersville, Maryland, and sponsored by the 1772 Foundation, and powered by Preservation Maryland. Thanks for listening and keep on preserving.